Our next presenter is Sister Miriam James Highland. Sister Miriam James was raised in Woodland, Washington, and is a graduate at the University of Nevada, Reno, where the society, where she played volleyball on a scholarship and majored in communications. Upon her graduation, she joined the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, a missionary community that serves global areas of the deepest apostolic need. Please, Please help, help us, us welcome, welcome on the, to stage, the stage Sister, Sister Miriam, Miriam James Highland. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. What's up? Okay, awesome. All right. How are y'all doing tonight? It is very nice to see you. I do have to say just one thing before we start. Somebody brought it to my attention that some of y'all in the crowd have like these little laser pointers. Okay, that's gonna burn my retinas out, okay? So don't be pointing it at me during the talk, all right? Um, it just, it's hard to concentrate when you do that. So if you could put those away for me, that would be really awesome. I wanna tell you first and foremost that um, tonight I'm gonna talk about love, like love. You know, that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, but let me ask you, let me ask you, oh, let me tell you this first of all. Um, so I knew that I was coming to this conference for a long time, and I want you to know that I've been praying for you for a long time. And there's people across the country, I was telling some of the ladies in the ladies conference today that, you know, there's women across the country, there's people across the country that don't even know you, that just out of love are interceding for you tonight. They're interceding for your freedom, they're interceding for your joy, they're interceding for your life, that you become totally set on fire. Now, does anybody want to be totally set on fire at all? All right. Me too. So, if we're going to talk about love, love, as you know, has a hierarchy. So, if we're going to talk about love, I've got to talk about something that I dearly love, which is, it's kind of base, but any sports fans in the house? Any sports fans? All right. No feedback there. All right. So, uh, me too, by the way. Okay. And um, I don't know if you're going to watch that little game next week. What's it called? The Super Bowl? Anybody going to watch the Super Bowl next week? All right. So, now. <laughs> I, uh, as you can tell, as you can tell, somebody's watching Downton Abbey, but that's your thing, man. Okay, you go for that. All right. So as you can tell, obviously, I'm a nun. And what we're going to do now is you're going to be part of something very special. So I am actually going to, because I'm nun and I have nun superpowers, I'm going to actually predict the winner of next week's Super Bowl. Okay. So what you're going to do is, on the count of three, shh, on the count of three, I will have you either shout out one of two things. You may be a Broncos fan with Peyton Manning or a Panthers fan with Cam Newton, okay? So you, <laughs> you may only, you may only shout out Broncos or Panthers. Don't do the Patriots because that's over, man. Let it go. Okay, so. On the count of three, you may shout it out. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. Let me just, let me just kind of, shh. let me just calculate it here, calculate, calculate. I think it's the Broncos, right? <laughs> no, Peyton, Peyton Manning and I are the same age, so I'd like to see the old man go out in style, you know what I'm saying? Okay, so, but let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. So one of the groups I follow on Twitter is College Game Day, okay, one of my favorite things. So can you pull up that slide for me, the motivation board? And this year, one of the things that College Game Day did is they tweeted out a picture of the motivation board in the Michigan State locker room. Now, so every day before the players go out to practice, they see this board, and there's all sorts of pithy sayings, as you can see, like sustained excellence and one more rep attitude. They probably should have done a couple more because they got smoked by Alabama in the Cotton Bowl, but that's okay. All right, so, but, but... At the very bottom of the screen, at the very bottom of the screen is actually the quote that made me take a screenshot of this tweet. And at the very bottom of the screen it says, success isn't owned, it's leased, and the rent is due every day. Success isn't owned, it's leased, and the rent is due every day. Yes? Okay. Which got me thinking, you know, that's interesting because anything that requires excellence is a daily process. So you know that this summer the Olympics are going to happen again and they're going to happen in Rio, right? And four years ago in London, 
Michael Phelps won every gold medal in swimming there ever was. He won like, a, he won like go, I think he won the gold medal in long jump because he's Michael Phelps. So like, hey man, just give it to him. Okay, so he won like every gold medal there was to win. And then he quote unquote retired. And then he's like, no man, I can't do that. So he comes out of retirement. And he's going to compete again this summer in more sports. And I can guarantee you that the man didn't retire and then just get off the couch and compete. He's been disciplining himself every single day because success isn't owned, it's leased, and the rent is due every day. And you could easily equate that with love, with holiness, with sanctity. That the gifts that God gives us is sanctity. Saints are not just found in the beautiful stained glass windows of your church. They're not just found whatever saint you're named after, whatever confirmation saint you took. Yes, holiness is there. But sanctity, my dear friends, holiness, the stuff that saints are made of, sits here in this room tonight. It's in you. It's in you. And so often in our lives, and I, when I talked to some of the ladies today, I told them a bit of my story. I'll, talk, I'll tell you some of my story at the end about addiction and brokenness and just all the areas of my life that are just longed for more. And I thought, what does God have anything to do with me? What does it have to do with me? Because I didn't understand, right? I didn't understand. And I was asking this question this whole time of like, what am I going to do with my life? Who will I become? And really the ultimate question for you, the only question that only you can answer is who will you be? Will you say yes to the call to love? Or will you stay your whole life in mediocrity? I found a commercial I want to show you. Um, it's actually a commercial for a sporting good company. And they answer this question, they ask this question, and they answer it very well. So can you pull up that commercial for me, the question, please? Who will you be when the choices you make make all the difference? See, the true tests, they don't come easy. And they won't last long. But that's why you're here. For these very moments. Because there's nothing that tests you like sports begs of you one simple question and it asks without passion or prejudice but that question demands an answer the whole answer it's the only answer you can give it lies to no one interesting huh and I, I love, there's a lot of things I love about that commercial, and it's obviously talking about sports, and he says there's nothing in life that tests you like sports, which I would totally disagree with. There's a lot of things that do. But he says, you know, the true tests, they don't come easy. But that's why you're here for these very moments. And you know what? Success, it lies to no one. And you might get lucky every now and then and score a home run. You might be the hero of the game every now and then. But people that are successful over and over, people that are holy, people that live life abundantly, people that pursue excellence, pursue it every day. But I think, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, I've won all these different, you know, events in my life, I've won games, all this kind of stuff. But there's something about that, even that, that asks, like, who will you be? But ultimately, we're asking something far more than just on a superficial kind of shallow level because sports is great, but, man, sports passes away. One day you're going to play, you're going to be amazing, and the next time somebody else comes up, that's how it works. Like, the generation after generation, the bigger, faster, stronger, everybody gets better. But ultimately, we're looking for something more. C.S. Lewis, any C.S. Lewis fans, Chronicles of Narnia fans, any C.S. Lewis, okay. Can you pull up that slide with the quote from C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis says this, he says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I love that. If you find in yourself a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is you were made for another world. And you know, all of our thirst have an answer to them. If I'm thirsty, I'm going to get a drink of water. If I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. Our thir there's a thirst for something more that we try to satisfy a lot of times with all these things, and a lot of times we call them love. But yet, there's nothing on earth that can satisfy, no matter how many degrees you have, no matter how good looking you are, how much money you have, there's this intense hunger for something more. And I think every now and then this heaven breaks open and we have these amazing experiences. And I know you've had them as well. And I had one this summer, I was with my mom and my mom lives on the west coast, she lives near the Oregon coast. 
And sometimes when I go visit her, my mom's a widow. My dad died very suddenly many years ago. And so I just, I love my mom so much. Oh, my gosh. So we go to the beach for a couple days every year. And when you go to the beach in the Oregon coast, no matter what time of year it is, you don't go to ever swim. You go to look at the water, man, because it's always freezing. Okay, so sure enough, it's the end of August. It's 50, 55 degrees and raining, right? <laughs> so my mom go to the beach, and it's raining, went to Mass, and we came back home that morning. And we had a little condominium that overlooked the water there, the beach. And I opened the window. And you could hear the waves crashing onto the shore. And you could smell the rain. You know what rain smells like? And my mom and I are sitting there, and we're listening to the waves, you know, crashing along the shore, and we're smelling the rain. We're both holding huge cups of coffee, because we have, like, a mutual love of coffee, you know? And I just was sitting there looking out the window, smelling the rain with my mom. And I had this moment, and I know you've had them too, where you just say, man, you know what? I wish time would stop right here. <laughs> I, I just wish it would stop. And I just wish this joy, this peace, this beautiful, just serenity. I wish this moment would never end. Those are, I believe, times when just heaven invades earth. And it's like, I, I call those the appetizers to the main entree, right? Like Hansel and Gretel, where like you have the breadcrumbs, but you don't get eaten at the end because that's scary, okay? So, you know, but what that does is it leads us to heaven. Because see, as beautiful as this world is, this is not our home. Thank God. And we're so longing for love in our life. We're so longing for excellence and so longing for satisfaction that many times we like try to set up camp right here. Like in the Gospels when the disciples, you know, Jesus is transfigured. They're like, Lord, let's just set up a couple tents. I mean, let's, let's hang out right here. This is cool, right? God says, no, there's something more for you. This heaven or this earth is not your home. There's something more. Why? <laughs> because God loves us. Um, Pope Benedict, one of my favorite, uh, incredibly intelligent man. Can you pull up that slide for me? He says, we are not some casual and meaningless, we're not a, some casual, meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. Each of us is willed, each of us is loved, and each, each of us is necessary. You are not some product of casual encounter. You're not some product of, you know, kind of meaningless existence that you just kind of try to make the best of this life and then kind of go on to some, I don't know what else afterward. That you are meant to be here. And we have a really wonderful priest. I live in Corpus Christi, Texas, and we have a really wonderful priest down there, and he's, just, he's a pastor of this thriving parish. And he tells this story. He said every now and then a couple will come to him, and sometimes they're married, and sometimes they're not. And, they, you know, they have a, a son or a daughter with them, and he gave the example of a son, and they come up to Father Tony, and they say, Father, this is our son Juan. He was an accident. It's awkward. Okay, yeah. And Father, he's great. He said, he goes, you know, I've been in a lot of accidents in my life, and none of them have looked like that, let me tell you, okay? He said, this boy is not an accident. He's a gift to you. A gift to you. He's meant to be here. He has a destiny and a dignity, and God has chosen him to be here, no matter the product, no matter the circumstances of your conception. And don't we hear those messages at times? You know, I talk to people all over the country, and sometimes you hear that story where adults, man, 60, 70 years old, as well as young people say, you know, the message that I get at home, my parents say to me, oh, man, what's wrong with you? How can you be more like your older brother? Look at him. He gets straight A's, captain of the football team, man, what's your problem? Why can't you be more like him? Or, and I gave this example earlier to the girls, well, we wanted a boy, but we got you. Right? You know what, I met a, a, a woman a few months ago who had that story and her parents wanted a boy so much they actually named her a boy's name and she grew up her whole life thinking she was an accident that she was a mistake that somehow God had played some cruel joke on her this is very interesting you know when we think of God even the word God can be kind of like Ugh. and I know all of us in this room we all have different stories I know that and I think some of us in this room believe in God some of us probably don't some of us probably hate God some of us are probably like man don't even go there don't even get me started so it's very important for us to understand when we say God, what do we mean? And I don't know about you, you know, I grew up Catholic and I went to public school and I did the whole CCD thing, and I, but I never fell in love with God. I didn't understand. And I had this image of God for a long time. I don't know what yours is, but we have a lot of them, I think, in our hearts. And I had this image of God as what I call the policeman in the sky, right? And he's standing back there and he's, you know, got a ticket book. He's left-handed, by the way. And he's standing up there. God's left-handed, we know that, because that's excellent, okay? Okay. Um, so he's standing up there with his ticket book, and he's looking at me from afar, and he's saying, oh, I saw that one. Ooh, you just went to confession for that. That's like double I'm going to write that down twice. So he writes it down twice, you know. If God is like that, if God is about our oppression, about our destruction, 
if God wishes to crush us, if God wishes to suck the life out of us, then we would have every right to rebel. But if God is a good, good father who wills us into existence, who sends his son to die for us so that we could be set free no matter how sinful we are, if that is who God is, then we have no reason to rebel at all. And I think it kind of depends on when we look at God, what do we mean when we talk about love? Because for a lot of us, we got a lot of different definitions of love. There's some very interesting ones out in the world right now, aren't there? If you, can you pull up that slide for me? When we talk about love as Christians, we're not talking about emotions. We're talking about the definition that actually Th Thomas Aquinas, we just celebrated his feast day, that he gives us. That to love is to will the good of the other. Now, I know that I love you based not on how strongly I feel about you because emotions come and go. And emotions are very important. We're given an intellect and a will, passions and emotions. And a word, the word emotion, the root word meaning emote means to move. And what emotions are supposed to do is they're supposed to power us to choose all that is good, true, and beautiful. So that our intellect chooses it, our will chooses it, and that we're living in excellence. To live in virtue is to live in excellence. But as we all know, we're kind of broken, right? So many times we live out of our emotions, purely our emotions. And so love is equated by emotion. But you know what? I know that the, the amount that I love you is based on how much am I going to will your good. I know that I love you, and you know that I love you if I'm going to will what is good for you no matter what the cost no matter what the cost. And we see Jesus who comes from heaven, he takes on our flesh to redeem our flesh, a man like us in all things but sin, because sin diminishes. He is the fullness of all we hope to be. He's stripped naked, he is the bridegroom, stripped naked on the cross, bleeds out, gives his life so his bride can live, because that's what a man does. He shows us his love for us. But love can be very confusing. And you know, sometimes I think that we, when we think about love, I kind of liken it to maybe like kind of a water bottle here, okay? So I'm a bit parched, okay? So, so say, for example, I know here's my water bottle. It's got lovely water in it. Water is very important. You probably die of dehydration before you die of starvation, okay? So it's important to stay hydrated. There's your public service announcement for the evening. All right, so I'm thirsty, and I'm going to take a drink. I'm not going to drink at all because that would be weird, okay? So I put my lid back on it, and when I'm finished with it, I'm going to throw it away because I'm done with it, and I have no use for it. I've drained my pleasure from it, and I'm finished. I'm going to throw it away. Now, that is an entirely appropriate response to a thing, because it's a water bottle. But what if I treated people like that? <laughs> it might look something like this. Girl, mm. I love you. No, I mean it. I love you. I've never said anything like this to anyone before. Okay, I've said it before, but I didn't mean it, okay? All right, I mean it this time. Like, I love you. Like, I can't feel my face when I'm with you. You know what I'm saying? It's that kind of love, all right? But I love it. Um, can I just, let me just say one thing. Ladies, 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 ladies. If a guy ever says he can't feel his face when he's with you, call 911. He's probably having a stroke, okay? Anyway, so, all right. So, I love you. I love you when you're, when you're fun, and uh, we have a good time, and you give me pleasure, uh -huh. but uh, as soon as uh, you're not fun anymore, and you become inconvenient, and you make me suffer, I guess this didn't work out, right? And we call this love, and then we say to you, God loves you, and you're like, I'm not interested. And rightfully so, because if that's how God loved us, we'd be right to be not interested, because that's called lust, that's called using, that's called consumerism. I'm going to consume you, and when you're done, when I'm done draining my pleasure from you, then you're done. And it's not just sex, it's other things as well. When you're not convenient to me, when you, be, you make me suffer, then forget it, I don't want to even talk to you. But that's not what love is. And you know, I ran a daycare after school for many years at a, at a school in Seattle, Washington, and I tell this story often, it's one of my favorite stories. And I was telling the ladies earlier this, this story. And you know, if you've ever watched little kids after school, and if you've ever watched 25 or 30 little kids after school, okay, and you know that about 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, some meltdowns begin to happen, okay? Like wailing and gnashing of teeth, and Barbie's heads fly off, and all kinds of things, okay? So, I love those kids. Oh my gosh, I don't live there anymore, but to this day, I still love them, I pray for them, but I'm not their mom. And every now and then, one of the kids would become inconsolable, like, 
crying, crying so hard. You probably, little brother does that. Crying so hard they can't even talk, you know. And they've got Legos in their hand and they're just sobbing. And I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 what's, whoa, what's wrong? What's wrong? Baby, look. <gasps> they can't even talk, you know. And I'm bent. I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. What happened? And they're so upset they can't even tell you. And I know that his older brother was sick the week before. And he, I, I'm, my guess is he's probably getting sick. And he just will not stop crying. Now, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't want to call mom because mom's a single mom. God bless single moms. Oh, my gosh, what a hard life that is. Loving their kids or trying to do the best they possibly can, you know. Mom's got two jobs already. I don't want to call mom because mom's going to have to come and pick him up, you know. That's a hard life. Oh, it's a hard life. But her little boy is sick, okay. So I, I got to call mom. So I call mom on the phone and say, Mom, um, I think your little boy is sick. He won't stop crying. Can you come pick him up? And oh, whoa, when immediately when she hears her little boy is sick, her voice is one of concern. She's like, I'll be right there, sister, I'll be right there, okay? So like 20 minutes later, you know, you hear a knock on the daycare door, and she's a mom on a mission because <laughs> her baby's sick. So she comes in looking for her little boy. She's concerned, you know? And sometimes that little boy would see her before she would spot him, and he, he'd just take off running across the floor. And he had little Legos in his hands. He's crying, and she sees him. She's like, oh, baby, <gasps> And she bends down, oh, and she scoops him up, and she puts him right on her heart, and she just stands there in front of everybody and just rocks him back and forth. She's like, it's okay, baby. Mama's here. You're safe. It's okay. It's okay. I'll take care of you. It's okay, okay? And after a while, she gets him to do what nobody else can do, is she gets him to stop crying, right? And she sets him down, and she goes into our closet, and she gets his little backpack and his little jacket, and she says, okay, we're going to go to the store, okay? He's like, okay, mommy. <laughs> and she takes his hand, and she walks out the door. She says, thanks, sister. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm like, thanks, mom. <laughs> and yeah, she had to go to her boss and tell her boss she has to miss work again because her son is sick. And that conversation didn't go over too well, but she loves her children, and she'll do anything it takes. She would lay down her life for her kids. How many of your parents, if you were sick, maybe some of you have been sick, and parents in the crowd, how many of you would easily say if your child was sick, Lord, give the sickness to me, I'll take it. Please don't let my child suffer, I'll take it on. I will take it on because I love them. And that's the love that costs, right? It's, it's, it's difficult marriages, it's problems that we have, it's the love that continues to give and to last in season and out of season, for rich or for poor, for sickness or in health, forever, and not till death do us part, but forever, for all eternity. You know, it's not to talk about marriage, but that's why marriage is the icon, a small window into how God loves us. The, a, a marriage lived out is a window of how God loves us and in season and out of season. A container for we can flourish, where we can thrive, where we, you know, we come to find out who we truly are. But that will never happen as long as we remain in the areas of lust and immaturity and addiction and brokenness. Because love has got to mature just like excellence in a sport has got to mature every day. Every choice you make every single day will bring you along the path to maturity or brokenness. And you know I love, any Pope Francis fans in here? Any Pope Francis fans? Okay, wrong. Okay. Pope Francis. Can you pull up that quote for me? Um... When Pope Francis came to America, I hope you know he came to America a few months ago, but um, one of his last talks was to actually to a, an address to American bishops. And I'm just going to, I know this is kind of a long quote, but I'm just going to read it to you because people say, oh, the Pope, like, what does he know? Holy cow, man, you talk about this guy knowing. So here's what he said to the American bishops, and he's talking about our society, our culture. So he's talking about the kind of love, the consumerism that we just looked at. He says this, he says, the result of consumerism is a culture which discards everything that is no longer useful or satisfying for the taste of the consumer. This causes great harm. I would say that at the root of so many contemporary situations is a kind of impoverishment born of a widespread and radical sense of loneliness, running after the latest fads, accumulating friends on one of the social networks. We get caught up in what contemporary society has to offer. And here's what Pope Francis says contemporary society offer us. He says, it is loneliness, with a fear of commitment and a limitless effort to be recognized. Sound familiar? <laughs> Talk about being restless, right? Loneliness with a fear of commitment and a limitless effort to feel recognized. Exhibit A. <laughs> All right. So who of us have not done this? Okay, I'm going to pull up my Twitter feed for you, okay? Who has not done this? And I know sometimes we, as adults, we bag on teens for doing this stuff, but adults do it too. Oh my gosh, don't even play. Okay, here we go. So... 
So, you know, you pull up your Instagram feed or whatever, your Twitter feed, and you just like start scrolling through your feed, right? And you start looking through your, you know, posts and you're like, oh my gosh, has she lost weight? She looks great. What filter is she using? Oh my gosh, she looks so awesome. Okay. Oh, his dad bought him another truck. Well, he was drunk when he crashed the first one. His dad doesn't know that, but I do. Oh. Oh, they got another raise, depending on where you are in your life. Oh, they got another raise. Oh, they had another child. Say, you know, a couple struggling to get pregnant the first time. Oh, she had child number five. Oh, my gosh, she liked her photo. I can't believe it. She looks so fat in that. I can't believe you told me. And we scroll, and we scroll, and we scroll, and we scroll. And after a while, we look at this, and we call this reality. <laughs> but let's be really honest. You only put your best stuff on here, right? I mean, if your nose looks big, you're like, oh, my gosh, take that off. I look awful, right? And we call this reality. And after a while, we scroll here, and maybe you've done this. I know I've done it. I've been looking at my feet going, man, I'm pretty sure that I have the lamest life ever on planet Earth. Like, my life is, like, totally lame because I see, like, all these people doing all these amazing things, you know. And we call this reality. And somebody retweets your stuff or they, they like your Instagram photo or they make a comment. Oh, my gosh, you look amazing. And for a second, it gives you a passing feeling of satisfaction, doesn't it? Like, oh, my gosh, I'm seen. Like, somebody sees me. And then it passes and we go back to our loneliness with our fear of commitment. We don't want to commit to anything, you know, because something better might come along. In a limitless effort to feel recognized, so we post again and we post again and we post again, hoping that somehow this will satisfy us. And we scroll and we scroll and we scroll and we scroll. And we're so hungry for something more and we think I don't know we think well I don't know maybe I need something more maybe I need more followers maybe I need more explicit material maybe I need more this because we don't understand this is not going to satisfy us technology is a great tool obviously I love it but it's not God and sometimes we worship at that altar you know what I'm saying this is like everything to us this matters more than what God says about us this matters more than you know anything else in our life and this is passing away it's just a struggle at times for us, you know, and whether if it's like a loneliness or a fear of commitment, or many times in our life, you know, we have these areas in our life where we just shut people out. And, you know, at our daycare, we had a, a on one side of the street was the, the school and the church and everything, and on the cross the street was the playground, and there was a gymnasium, it was like an afterthought. So our side of the street, the school and the church took up an entire city block, and separating the playground was a street. Now, in the middle of the day, the street was blocked off, and the kids would just run across the street, you know. But after school, the city made us take the cones down, so cars were driving by, and there was no crazy, there were no speed bumps, nothing, and cars would just fly up that street. So every year at the beginning of school, we would have a little conversation. So I'd take the kids out to the school, and I'd kind of line them up, you know, and I'd say, okay, everybody toes on the line, okay, men, what do you see? Look to your right, look to your left, what do you see? Oh, there's no cones. Yeah, there's no cones. What happens when there's no cones? Cars drive by. Okay, cars drive by. All right, so here's the deal. If you ever, 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 ever cross the street in front of us, you're going to lose your recess. You're going to have to go back inside. <gasps> oh, yeah, we're serious, okay? One of the sisters will always step into the street in front of you, and we will make sure there are no cars coming. And even if you think there are no cars coming, we will always go in front of you and make sure that nothing will happen to you. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you understand the consequences? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So we'd mark every the first week of school, and the older kids were like, this is so dumb, sister. I'm like, yeah, just do it, man. And so we'd line up, you know. Well, if you know little kids, man, I know you've got little brothers and sisters. You know that after a couple months, and like they see the playground, they see the swings, and they got the ball, and they're like, oh, playground swings. One of them will just take off right in front of you across the street. And if you've ever had a little kid run out into a street in front of you, it stops your heart. So I'm like, oh, oh, oh. What happened? I ran across the street. Oh, yeah, you did. Okay. Um, so uh, what happens when you run across the street? You get run over. Yeah, you get run over. So um, remember what we talked about? Remember that we said every choice has a consequence? So because you chose to run out to the street in front of us, you're going to lose your recess. You're going to go back inside. <gasps> what? And oh, it is on now. World War III. I'm the worst nun ever. I'm so mean. I can't believe you ever made me do that. I hate you, sister. Take the ball and like kick it against the school wall. I'm never coming back to this daycare. I hate you. All right, man. Tell your mom I said hi. See you tomorrow, okay? <laughs> Sorry. Or, 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 it's the classic hand on the hip. You're not the boss of me. Don't tell me what to do. Said every kindergartner ever, yes, I am, get your crayons and go back inside, I am the boss of you, right? But you know, I wonder, 
little kids teach us a lot. Oh, there's, there's, there's a reason why Jesus keeps saying, you know, become like little children. They teach us so much. And it's kind of funny, It's because that's a bit childish, right? But I wonder, for us, how many of us stand in the street of life, no matter how young or old we are, with our hand on our hip, with our little fist up to God, saying, God, man, you're not the boss of me. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do with my body. <laughs> Don't tell me who to love. Don't tell me to go to Mass on Sunday. Don't tell me to serve the poor. Don't tell me what to do because you're not the boss of me. I'm going to do what I want to do. Back off. And you know, um, I'm a spiritual mother. There's many people in my life that I love. But I can only imagine parents standing on the side of the street and watching their kids in the street. And the parents like saying, come out of the street. And the kid's like, no, man, don't tell me what to do. See, the reason why God, and you talk about the laws of love, that we're called to love. The laws of love have parameters because that's what helps us thrive. And just like those little kids, a lot of times all they can see is the street right there. They don't understand that I have the foresight. I can see to the right and to the left. I know what will happen to them if they run out to the street. And so out of my love for them, I'm going to set up boundaries. But see, they don't get that because all they see is right now. And they say to me, you're not the boss of me. We don't understand that it's out of the laws that God gives us his love. <laughs> it's from those boundaries that he sets up so we can thrive as human beings because he knows what's going to break us. He knows that a misuse of our bodies will break us. He knows that a misuse of our mind, our intellect, or he knows that's going to break us. And he doesn't just stand off from afar saying, hey, get out of the street. He sends his own son to take on our sin for us to set us free so we could live for him, with him forever for all eternity. And he's saying, man, come home. <laughs> come home. Pope Francis visited the Philippines um, last year. Can you pull up that slide for me? And uh, maybe you saw this particular event, but... Uh, he talked to a lot of people in the Philippines, and uh, Filipinos are amazing, oh my gosh. You talk about a people, just the incredible people, just the people as a nation, as a people, man, they suffer. Oh, you talk about suffering, oh my gosh. Typhoon after typhoon, it just, it's incredible. One of the meetings that Pope Francis had, you see him hugging a little girl there, was a meeting with street children. And there were four kids that told their story, three boys and a little girl. And they're kids on the street, and they're rescued by a Catholic shelter who brought them in and are helping rehabilitate their lives. But they took turns telling the Fr Pope Francis their story one by one. And the third person to go was a little boy. And he said, Holy Father, you know, I was left on the street, and we ate out of the trash can. There was no food for us to eat. We fought for food out of the trash can. At night, we would hide from adults who wished to buy and sell children. We would hide from them. And after a while, I was rescued. It was quite a long story. But the last person to speak was that little girl that you see right there in that picture. And she stood up in front of the Pope, and she's 12. <laughs> and she said, um, in front of all these important people, all these dignitaries, and she stood up in front of him and she said, Holy Father, um, sometimes suffering comes at the hands of your own family. My mom and dad were too poor, so they just left me on the street and they went home. And she said, I too ate out of the trash can, and... I, too, hid at night out of fear because I wasn't sure what was going to happen to me. And then at that moment, she just began to cry. And she said, um, Holy Father, why would God allow this to happen to us? And why are there so few people to help us? And Pope Francis had a whole speech planned, and he set that speech down. And he looked around at all these important people. And he said, this little girl, this little girl has asked the only question to which there is no answer. And he said, sometimes the only answer we can give is tears. And he talked about how God, when we suffer, God does not give us arguments, fancy arguments or little platitudes. He said, God accompanies us in our suffering, that he sees us, his gaze is upon us. He united with our suffering so much that he took it upon himself that we never suffer alone. We are never alone. And he got up and he hugged that girl to his chest and she wept on his heart. This is a year of mercy, as I'm sure you know. And it's very interesting, you know, mercy. Who of us in this room has not asked that same question of God, saying, God, why would you allow this to happen to me? Why would you allow my parents to divorce? Why do you allow this abuse? Why do you allow my friend to commit suicide? Why did you allow this to happen to me? And then you say you love me. And that, no matter how young or old we are, my dear friends, has the just, is a huge, 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 just a hole in our heart. And it is there 
And many times we're afraid of those questions. So we like play it off. We're like, oh man, this is so dumb. You know, we play it off because we're so broken. <laughs> you know, in my own life, I ask that question so often in my own life. In my own story of being, you know, conceived out of wedlock. My biological parents were 17 years old. They were seniors in high school. Obviously not married, doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And I was the product of their union. And I don't know them to this day. I don't know them, but I have a deep intuition that at one point my mother thought of aborting me, but she didn't. And I stand here before you tonight because a scared 17-year-old girl said yes to life, and I was the child in her womb. And I was adopted. Yeah, God bless pro man. Woo, that's a hard choice. Um, I was adopted, and my parents loved me very much. Um, it's like I was telling the ladies earlier this morning and this afternoon. Um, but when I was a child, some things happened to me that I didn't tell anybody about. And there's a saying in the 12-step program that we're only as sick as our secrets. We're only as sick as our secrets. And when I was 11 years old, I had my innocence taken from me, and I didn't tell anybody. I kept it a secret. And when I was 13, somebody older came along, and he took everything that was left of my innocence from me, and my life just shattered. And I didn't tell anybody. I began drinking at 12 years old. That was the only way that I found that I could escape the pain of my life, and I didn't tell anybody. Now, you talk about facades, man. You talk about masks. You talk about hand on your head, man. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I thought that if I was just skinny enough and pretty enough and good enough and funny enough, at, good enough at volleyball and funny enough, well, then maybe you wouldn't see the truth because I hated this. I hated who I was. I hated the brokenness. I hated the depression. And, you know, I was excelling in life. It was a great mask. So here I am, 21 years old, playing Division I college volleyball against some of the top teams in the nation. I was already an alcoholic. And I did not want to hear about forgiveness. I did not want to hear about mercy. I don't, I, I can't even. Because I thought, how could God love a girl like me? How could God love a girl? How could he allow this to happen? And God speaks something very deep when we're very honest. I think we're afraid of honesty sometimes. We think God's afraid of us like, if, as if God's like, oh, my gosh. You know? <laughs> he's like, okay, I, I can do this. Come on, come on. Because he's not afraid. We're terrified. We're terrified of our brokenness. I look into my heart at times and I'm like, oh, you know, God's not afraid. And many times in my life, you know, when I'm struggling, I see myself kind of interiorly as kind of curled up in a little ball, just, just frustrated. You know how we get frustrated? You know, you go to the confession for the same thing over and over and over again, and you're just struggling with your own stuff, right? And my fear is like, I see myself in my mind kind of like this, and my fear is that God's going to come to me with his hand on his hip. Jesus is going to be like, girl, you better get yourself together. <laughs> you're not for the love of Pete, man. Come on. Look how long, look at you. You've been through therapy, you've been through counseling, you've been to confession a million times. Like, what's your problem? Can't you get yourself together? And I can tell you honestly that that has never once happened. <laughs> so often in my life, I see him and he comes and sits beside me. And he hears my heart and he sees my pain. And if I'm sinning, he's going to tell me because he wants me to be well. But God doesn't mock us. He doesn't make fun of us. His love is tender and it is strong and it is fierce and it is transforming. And that's a choice we have to make. And, you know, in his letter to the, for the year of mercy, Pope Francis writes this. Can you pull up that slide for me What's about mercy? He says, we are called to show mercy because mercy has first been shown to us. Pardoning offenses, pardoning offenses becomes the clearest expression of merciful love. And at times, how hard it seems to forgive. Yet pardon is the instrument placed in our fragile hands to attain serenity of heart. Pardon is the instrument placed in our fragile hands to attain serenity of heart. And I tell you what kept me sick for so long, what kept me as an alcoholic and addicted to lust and all my brokenness was unforgiveness. Where I just did not want to forgive the person who did that to me. Do you have any idea what they've done? Like, no way. And I had a vision of myself one day, you know, the, the parable where Jesus talks about the unforgiving servant. Where the master forgives a servant and the servant goes and finds somebody else who owes him a mere fraction of the amount. And the servant throttles him saying, man, you pay back what you owe me. I saw myself right there, and that was me. That was me 20 years later grabbing this person by the collar of their shirt saying, man, you pay back what you owe me because you owe me. And he did because he took a lot from me. But in that moment, I realized that, man, I was going about this whole thing the wrong way. Because, see, forgiveness, I thought forgiveness meant if I forgive you, I'm going to let you off the hook. Like, what you did didn't matter. Oh, forgive and forget, just get over it. And it was a huge deal. It gave me souls, scars on my soul that I'll probably have till the day that I die. It was a huge deal. Forgiveness is not making light of something. 
And I'm, I'm, please, I'm not making light of this. When Jesus is hanging on the cross naked and bleeding out for us, he's not saying, oh, it's okay, guys, don't worry about it, not a big deal. You know? He bleeds out for us. So forgiveness is not saying it didn't matter. Forgiveness is choosing to release our grasp on the person or the situation and commending them to God and seeking no revenge. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Who do you have your grasp on? <laughs> Woo. Who do you have by the collar of their shirt saying, man, you pay, that's what you owe me. And maybe it's God. <laughs> because we think at times God's out to destroy us. God is out to crush us because we don't understand and as we choose my dear friends as we choose to release forgiveness is like love is not a feeling we're called to love we're called to forgive this is the clearest expression of merciful love to choose forgiveness with your will tonight I don't know who in your mind who's coming to your mind right now would you be willing would you be willing to maybe begin the process of forgiveness and, you know, I heard at a 12-step meeting one time this woman was saying, you know, have you ever been, like, what we call in-between surrenders? Like, in the 12-step, you talk about surrendering. So you've got, like, this surrender. So, like, say maybe you're sober now or maybe you're not as, like, murderous as you were. So you're right here, and this is great, okay? And you know that actually God's calling you to go over here. God is calling you to do something more. But you're actually kind of, quite frankly, stuck right here in the middle, and you don't really want to go over there, but you know you have to. <laughs> and she said, did you know that you can pray for the willingness to be willing? And I was like, ooh, that's brilliant. <laughs> Tonight, I don't know what your struggle is. I don't, I don't know what your struggle is. Porn, your struggle is anger, your struggle is perfectionism. Maybe you don't believe in God. Maybe you're like, this whole thing is stupid. Maybe you're angry at God. Might you be willing to be willing <laughs> to open the door a little bit to see what's on the other side? You know? We talk about serenity of heart. I have a commercial I want to show you, and it's really beautiful. You know, we talk about being comfortable in our own skin. And there's something beautiful about children and who they are. They're so transparent in who they are. And many times as adults, you know, we get older and we get kind of calloused and kind of hard, and we call that living. But there's something about children that we find so delightful. So I want to show you a little commercial. It's going to be self-explanatory. But these group of people, have, they're going to ask the adults, a group of adults, one question. And then they're going to ask a group of children the same exact question. And I think what you're going to see is the kids give two very different answers. So can you pull up that um, video for us, please? Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, let's do this. Team Fever, take one. Mark. So we've got one question that we want to ask you today. OK, well, what's that question? The question is, if you could change one thing about your body, what would it be? Um, only one. <laughs> um, I would change my forehead. I have a really big forehead. I'd like to be taller. The puffiness of my face. My ears. I have big ears. Stretch marks after having a baby. <laughs> a lot of times, like, kids would make fun of me. Like, hey man, you get big ears, you got Dumbo over there, you know? Definitely my skin, because I've dealt with acne and eczema issues ever since I was a little kid. Growing up, like a lot of people call me like five head or like your forehead's so big, they've always like would say something to me about it. Yo diría porque muchos dos caminan derecho y como que mi pie está un poco chueco. When I was younger, I felt like I wasn't quite adequate enough. Can you sit on the chair? No. All right, I'm going to ask you one question. What's the question? If you could change one thing about your body, what would you change? Um, hmm. Um, you don't have a mermaid tail. Probably like a shark mouth so I could eat a lot of stuff. 
I could have teleportation in my body. Extra pointy ears. I want legs like a cheetah so I can run faster in a cheetah. I could have wings so I could fly. I don't think there's anything to change. I like my body, actually. Yeah, you wouldn't change anything? Nothing else. Just my mom, too. <laughs> I love, I love that commercial on so many levels. And you know, it's interesting, you, know, you get the adults and you know, their kind of startups a little shallow. I like to be taller, all the puffiness on my face. Oh, then it goes very deep very quickly. And she's like, I like to change my forehead because when I was a forehead, my forehead was so big, people would be like, hey man, you're like a five head, right? And the guy with the big ears, and these are adults. These are grown ups saying, when I was a kid, they'd make fun of me to say, hey man, look at his ears, he's like Dumbo over there. And I think especially for those of us adults in the crowd tonight, the woman at the very end sums it up quite nicely when she says, when I was younger, I didn't feel quite adequate enough. And then the children come in, and one of them's so little she can't even sit on the chair, right? <laughs> and one of them wants legs like a cheetah so I can run faster like a cheetah, and one of them wants a shark mouth so they can eat a lot of stuff. My favorite is a little girl who says, I wish I had wings so I could fly. I'm like, oh, me too, <laughs> you know? You see their transparency, and this is before they've been picked on, before they've been bullied, before they've been made fun of and compared to other people. You see something so true in their life. They know they're loved. <laughs> they know that they are deeply loved, and they don't see life out of their wounds and out of their hurts and out of their pains. They see life out of their dreams <laughs> and what could be. And that is what we are called to in our call to love, like what do we spend most of our time doing? What idol do we spend our time grasping at? What do we spend worshiping when it is God who desires to order us to himself because that's where we become excellent? It's our deepest desire anyway. Last thing I want to share with you. Can you pull up my last slide for me? Um, I love this particular scripture passage uh, where Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I will not reject anyone who comes to me. I will not reject anyone who comes to me. And, you know, I, part of me was like, is that really a translation from the Greek? Like, are you sure? Like, not anybody? Like, except for you literally gross people over there. I will not reject anyone who comes to me. So whatever you sit here with tonight, God is not rejecting you. His desire is to heal you. And like I said, I don't, I don't know what your struggle is. And maybe it's same-sex attraction. Maybe it's brokenness. Maybe I don't know what your struggle is. I don't know if it's depression. I don't know if it's anger. I don't, I don't know what it is. But I do know that Jesus desires you to come to him. In the very first sentence of that letter that Pope Francis writes for the year of mercy, his very first sentence says, Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. That mercy has a face. Mercy and love is not some nebulous force in the universe. Sorry, Star Wars, you know what I'm saying? Like, it has a face. And it's his gaze, Pope Francis talks about, the gaze that accompanies us. And I was talking about this earlier. The gaze, you know, it's interesting. You, we gaze at what is lovely. You gaze at a sunset, you gaze at a beautiful, when the super moon was out, that super blood moon, people were just amazed by it. I remember being a little girl and going out into the night sky, just looking at the stars and just gazing at them and feeling so little, but not in a way that was overwhelming, but in a way that just elicited awe in my heart. When we bring a child, we bring the one you love. If you see a newlywed couple, man, they just gaze at each other. When was the last time somebody gazed at you? Not stared at you, because that's creepy, but gaze, you know. <laughs> I just want to propose this to you. Um, in my life, you know, many times I've had, like I said, I've got a lot of brokenness, and I've had a lot of pain, and it's been a long road. It was a road, first and foremost, of me getting honest with my life, of admitting I had addiction to alcohol and to lust, and admitting that I was, you know, angry inside, that I was clinically depressed, that I was just, I did not want to forgive. I had all this stuff, but, you know, we pretend a lot of times that stuff doesn't exist, and then we wonder why our life isn't going anywhere. Why can't I love? Because there's all this stuff in the way. God began to send people into my life. Wow, people. And one of the people he sent into my life was a Catholic priest. Can you, I just hear it for Catholic priest, anybody? All right, Amen. <laughs> Oh, man, love the priesthood, love the priesthood. And God sent this priest into my life, and this priest had been a priest a long time, so he knew what was up, right? And he would look at me, and he would say, who will you be? Who will you be? What do you want to do with your life? Because I know you long for more than this. 
I know you long. Why are you settling for lust and mediocrity? What are you doing? I know you long for more. And I said, I do, Father. I just, I just don't know how to get there. <laughs> and if you know somebody who's authentically holy, I hope you have somebody in your life who's authentically holy because they're amazing. Pope Benedict says, the one who has hope lives differently. And their life, yeah, they're broken and they got their stuff, but their life is different. They live differently. They're fully alive and they're funny and they're just their whole life is engaged. I remember looking at Father and I was 20, 21 years old in college. And I'm an alcoholic and, you know, I wanted for ESPN and I had all these quote-unquote dreams for my life. But I was so broken. I looked at his life and I said, man, Father, like, I don't know what that is. Like, you've got something. Like, I don't know what that is. But I want it. I want that. Can you show me? How, how do I get there? It was my mom on her knees praying and fasting for me who at one point was just so overwhelmed with my brokenness that she gave me away to our blessed mother. And she said, Mother, she's your daughter now because there's nothing I can do for her. I give her to you. I surrender her to you. She's your daughter. It was her praying and fasting, and she asked that Our Lady that day that I'd become a nun, and here I am before you tonight. Right? It's a power of prayer. That is the power of the heart of a mother. Of, that's the power of the heart of a father who loves. Who really loves. Who loves until it hurts. <laughs> a love that gives. A love that sees you and finds you delightful to behold. And let me propose this to you. Tonight, Jesus, as you know, is going to come truly body, blood, soul, and divinity here. And we're going to sit in his presence and we're going to be bathed in his glory. And I would just offer to you that Christ is going to gaze upon you tonight. And he's going to gaze at all of you, <laughs> all of your heart. And I want you to know that, yes, does he see your sin? Does he see your pain? Yes, he does. And his desire is to heal you and set you free. But the most true thing about you is that you're a son or a daughter of God. And he delights in you. And you are fearfully, fearfully loved so intensely loved. Who will you be? <laughs> will you let him love you? Let's just pray. Father, we welcome you here tonight. We welcome your love. We welcome your beauty. I thank you for every son and daughter that you brought here tonight. We ask you to pour out your mercy upon us. We ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come Come breathe life into our soul. Give us the courage to live the truth. We ask you, Jesus, you who are afraid of nothing, you who take on our sin to set us free, that you would come find us. Come find us where we're hiding. Come find us where we're pushing you away and give us the courage to say yes to you. Give us the courage to live out our destiny, to love, to heal the world, to bring your beauty because you love us. Oh, how you love us. Well, I've heard a thousand stories of what 